Cool. Welcome everyone to the final CAMP talk. I'm pleased to introduce Pinches Dernfeld, who will tell us about base change along the Frobenius endomorphism and the Gorenstein property. Pinches. And thank you for having me. Um, just a um, quick note, um, if you have questions and you put them in the chat, I might not see them. So if somebody can get my attention um, to the to the questions. All right, so um, although my, my talk is titled Base Change Along the Frobenius Endomorphism, uh, it's my my talk is actually about more a bigger class of endomorphism endomorphisms than Frobenius, but to just put Frobenius in there so people be interested and come to my talk. All right, so 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 what this talk is it's about the structure and properties of complex finite injective dimension over commutative interior rings, and of course. Um, Complex of finite injective dimension have uh, tell us a lot about uh, the ring itself, and there's some well-known examples. Um, for example, uh, if a local uh, a local ring is regular if and only, and uh, the residue field has finite injective dimension, and a local ring admits a finite finitely generated module of finite injective dimension is called Macaulay, and uh, and another another example where we use this a lot is a commutative interior ring that admits a finitely generated module of finite injective and projective dimension. That happens if and only if um, R is Gornstein, and this is due to Bass. And I'm actually using this uh, a little bit in this talk. Now, so let's just set up some um, settings and notation. So RMK will always be a local ring. We say endomorphism um, phi from R to itself is contracting if some power of phi takes the maximal ideal into the square of the maximal ideal. Um, when we have a contracting endomorphism, I set R phi to be the ring itself, but with, a with the right module structure induced by phi. And I denote by IR, I denote the subcategory of complexes of finite injective dimension. And IFGR will be the subcategory of IR of that, that consists of the complexes which, which have finitely generated homology. And then IFLR will be the complexes in IFGR where the old homologies are finite linked. So, 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 so let me give some examples of um, contracting endomorphism. The, the prototypical example is um, in characteristic P, the Frobenius endomorphism is always contracting. In fact, uh, the, the Frobenius always takes um, M into M squared and usually higher, depending on P. Um, contracting endomorphisms really um, extend a lot of the notions we know is, um, hold for Frobenius and a lot of the a lot of the properties that we know, um, for example, Contest theorem and other stuff, um, are also true for contracting endomorphisms. But um, contracting endomorphisms exist in, in all characteristics. Um, for example, if you take R to be KXY, might out, let's say, um, X, X cube, Y cube, the, and, and then you set phi of X is equals to Y and phi of Y is Y squared. This is a, a contracting anamorphism where phi of, phi of the maximal ideal is not, doesn't take the maximal ideal into the square of the maximal ideal. But if you go one step further, then, then it will. So, so you can have potentially um, phi contracting anamorphisms, which actually have to take it for a while until you get m to m squared. And then there are more um, interesting examples um, um, coming from semi-group rings, but I'm not going to get into that. All right, so my, my motivation for for looking at these come from a paper by Fellaholo and Marley in 2018, 
and they have this theorem. So let um, phi be a contracting endomorphism on a Colm McCauley local ring with the canonical module omega r. Then if the if the injective dimension of r phi tends here with omega r is finite, then then r is Gornstein. Well, it's, it's if, and, if and only if r is Gornstein. So um, then they ask the question, what if I replace um, omega r with a dualizing complex? Can, is it still true that um, r phi tends here with the dualizing complex has finite injective dimension if and only if r is Gornstein? And the answer they, they have in the paper is no. And they have an example, of course, of, um, of a ring that's not called Macaulay and has a dualizing complex and when you take you take you have a contracting endomorphism you take r phi tensor with a dualizing complex um, and that actually is st uh, still has finite injective dimension but obviously the link is not common college so it can be Gornstein. and just quick kind of reminded um, a dualizing complex uh, um, a complex d is dualizing if the following hold First, the injective dimension of D is finite. Then a, um, D has finitely generated homology. And the natural map of R to, into a R harm DD is a quasi isomorphism. So then they pose the question what if, um, instead of looking at the tensor product of R, phi, and D, I'm looking at the derived tensor product? So the question is if. If the injective, if R phi derived tensor with D as fine injective dimension, is R necessarily Gornstein? And then they have the, left this question open in the paper, and, and I was trying to answer this question. So this is how I got into um, this this topic. So so let me state the main theorem of of, the, of this of the stock. So. Um, let phi from R to R be a contracting endomorphism, then the following is uh, equivalent. One, R is Gornstein. Two, that exists a complex in, in IFGR. So this is a complex with um, finite injected dimension, finite genetic homology, non-trivial, such that um, the injective dimension of R phi derived tensor X is finite. And that's equivalent that, to saying that for every X, in IFGR, we have injective dimension of the derived tensor product of X and R phi is finite. And of course, this gives um, a positive answer to the question of for the whole Amari. But this is saying something stronger that um, when we want to answer the, this question by for the whole Marley, it, there's nothing special really about looking at dualizing complexes. We can look at any any complex of finite injective dimension is, is sufficient. All right, so for the rest of the talk, I wanna first, I wanna outline how, um, how this proof is and, and then dissect the outline of the proof and to see where, where the interesting parts to prove is and then, and then show how I do this. All right, so um, one one implies three is 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 easy. This is well known due to facts B because um, of course, in a Gorn steering, um, complexes of finite injective dimension um, are the complexes, the perfect complexes, and comp and of course when you take um, a, a contracting, you take an endomorphism, the pro projective dimension of a complex doesn't go up. So so if you start something that has finite projective dimension. The, the derived tensor product will also have finite projective dimension. Um, three implies two, which is, it, it, this is easy. We, we only need to show that in fact, that every local ring has a complex in IFGR with non-zero homology. And, uh, and, and this is not very hard. Um, you, in fact, you take the complex um, KR, which is the Kazoo complex on a minimal number of generators on the maximum ideal. You tend to that with the um, injective fall of the residue field. Is, it, this, is, this is not very hard to show. This is um, has non-zero homology. And since um, EK has, is a tinion and 
M kills the, the, this, this tensor product, this, it's just our exercise in Brunson Herzog that this in fact has finite length homology. The, the interesting part, uh, the interesting direction is to show um, two implies one. So if I have a complex with an IFGR with non-zero homology, such that the derived tensor product uh, with um, R phi is, has fine checked the dimension, then R has to be Gornstein. And so, so let me outline how I prove this. So let's assume we have this um, X in IFGR with HX not equals to zero with the derived tensor product. Um, have fine injected dimension. We have this follow. We have this series of implication. First of all, I can reduce um, x to a y, where y has finite length homology and non-zero homology. And, and this is very easy. Um, again, uh, one of the major themes of um, this um, these proofs are you you just tend to with the Kozu complex and. The tensor the Kozu complex is clearly has finite length, finite length homology. And this will imply that um, if I have, if I know this is true for one Y, if I know for, the, for, for one Y in um, IFLR, this derived tensor product has finite check the dimension, then this, this implies that it's going to hold for every Y in IFLR. And, and this is this is the, this is um, non-trivial, and this is going to be probably the bulk of my talk showing A implies B. However, once I know the once I know B, then uh, I, I forgot to mention. Uh, I want to clarify when I'm looking at the injective dimension here. I I I I, I mean. Maybe this is obvious to some people. It wasn't obvious when I read it first. When I, when I look at this injective dimension, I'm, I'm really looking over the target ring, not, not the source. Um, if you actually look at the, if you look at the injective dimension over the source ring, the, the, this is already known to be to hold if and only if um, R, R is actually regular. And this is already due to Avmuth, Eyinger and Miller, I believe. So, so anyway. So if I know that um, for, for every Y in IFLR, the, this derived tensor product has fine trajectory dimension, I, once I do it once, now I can forget that this Y is coming from the first ring, and now I can just look at the second ring and apply the same, uh, the fee again. But then we still have that, um, this, this R, R phi two derived tensor products with Y will have fine trajectory dimension. I can keep going like that. And, and that will show that um, for every for every Y in IFLR and every I bigger than zero, we have this derived tensor product with a higher powers of phi will, 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 and Y will have fine trajectory dimension. And then that, that, will, and that will show that um, projected dimension of y was finite over this over the sourcing. Uh, and this is also um, a little non-trivial and, and I will show how this is done. And then of course, D implies E that if I have, now I have this, this um, complex with finite injective dimension and finite projective dimension, non-zero non -zero homology, by fax B, this implies that R is Kornstein. All right, so um, so I, I wanna I wanna show how we we prove um, A implies B. So so I need to set up some notation and um, get some properties. So so we need the notion of tick subcategories. So a, a non-empty category of um, T of the R is tick if and only if it's full and it's closed undertaken direct summons. And for every exact triangle, we have the two out of three properties. I, I if, if any two of two, two complexes of the of this exact triangle belong to T, then so does the third. 
Uh, examples of um, tick subcategories are um, IFGR, IFLR, and perfect complexes. These, these are all tick subcategories in the R. Now, given an X in the R, I can take the tick subcategory generated by X, which we denote tick X. And this is defined to be the smallest tick subcategory of the R that contains X. And it can be obtained as the intersection of all tick subcategories containing X. For, for example, if um, you have an attenuating R, then the tick subcategory generated by R itself, these are all complexes, all the, all, all the perfect complexes. So in other words, all the complexes are finite um, projective dimension. When we have a local ring, then we always have that um, the tick subcategory generated by K, these are complex, these are bounded complexes with finite linked homology. Um, there is also a, a um, there's also a constructive way of um, getting tick Rx. Uh, and the way we can construct um, tick X is we, we set um, tick, zero, tick zero of, of X to be the, the zero complex. Tick one would be um, the direct summons of finite direct sums of shifts of X. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but um, we need the direct summons. And we, obviously, we need direct sums and shifts. And then for every n bigger than two, greater than equals to two, um, the, the objects of tick n of x are direct summons of objects u, such that we can fit u into an exact triangle, u prime to u to u double prime to um, where u double prime is in tick n minus one and u prime is in tick x. And it's not hard to see that the, so, so, so we call these, these the, 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 the tick n x, the n thickening of x. And it's not hard to see that every thickening of x embeds into the next one. So we have this filtration, um, tick zero of x contained in tick one and so on and so forth. And this is contained, everything's contained in the union. And so it turns out that um, the tick subcategory, subcategory generated by X is, um, is actually equals to the union of all these n thickenings of X. Uh, and the, the, one of the useful or the good things about um, these tick subcategories is that they behave well on the exact functors. So in other words, if you have an exact functor F from the R to the S, then the image of the tick subcategory sub generated by X is contained in the, in the tick subcategory sub generated by the image of X. It, it doesn't have to be necessarily be subjective, but you have containment. And the other thing I want to note is that for every X in the R and every com perfect complex P, the, these complexes, P tensor X and R harm PX, these are all contained in, in tick X. And, and this is often very useful um, when we either ten, tensor with the Kazoo complex or we take R harm with the Kazoo complex. And the, the, there's a lot of um, people um, who've used these kinds of things um, to get different results, very, inter very interesting results about different things. Let's also remind ourselves that the support for complex X is um, defined to be the, P, uh, the set of P and spec R where, um, where HX uh, localized at P is non-zero. And it is this, um, it's very easy to see from the construction of tick X that we have um, this relationship between support of a, of a complex in the, in, in the tick subcategory. So if Y is in tick X, then we definitely always have that support of Y is always contained in the support of X. Because um, if, um, if P is not in the support of X, 
then the fifth, then tick NFX is already zero. So when you take the, you keep taking all these thickenings, you always um, just add the zero complex. So Y has to be, Y localized at P would have to be the zero complex. But um, the, the, the converse is not true. Um, obviously, um, if you have any non-local, any non-regular ring, uh, that, let's say any, you take a, a regular, a non-regular local ring, then every complex, the support of any complex is contained in the support of R, but um, the, 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 we already seen that the tick subcategory generated by R, these are the perfect complexes. And, and obviously not every complex will be um, perfect if, if, the, if the ring is non-regular. But um, the converse do hold for um, perfect complexes. And this is um, due to the theorem by Hopkins to Neiman. Um, so, so I'm giving the a little bit simplified version of the Hopkins and Eamon because this is the only thing we really need here. Um, so if I, so if let R be a commutative engineering given complexes and perfect complexes N and M, if the support of N is contained in support of M, then N is contained in the tick subcategory sub -category generated by M. And the proof is left as an exercise to the DD. And it's, this is highly non-trivial and you, you need to go to um, do some stuff with um, tensor triangular categories. And I definitely don't want to talk about it or pretend that I remember the proof. So Hopkins and Neumann um, is very useful in many situations and sometimes it simplifies proofs and sometimes it, it, it really shows things that you, it's very hard to see otherwise. For, for example, um, if you, if you have a, um, a regular local ring, then K is in the tick sub, subcategory generated by X for every X with bounded, um, homolo bounded finitely, finite length homology. If, if you view it in as, as complex as in DR. However, in characteristic zero, it's, it's not known um, if, if K is in the tick subcategory generated by M in the module category, if um, M has finite length. And Takashi um, proved, proved, proved this true in characteristic P uh, using what I think is pretty clever trick. But um, in characteristic zero, it's not known. So uh, obviously in the derived category, where you can use Hopkins and Neiman, th th this becomes much easier. Anyway, so so I'm gonna, I'm gonna use Hopkins and Neiman to, to show the implication, um, which I believe was A implies B. All right, so um, I'm doing this by giving a partial analog for Hopkins and Neiman for the, for the, the subcategory IFLR. So the proposition is for every X in IFLR with non-zero homology, one has that um, the tick subcategory, subcategory generated by X is, e is equals to the entire subcategory IFLR. And I'm just gonna quickly outline how this proof goes. Well, clearly um, tick, the tick subcategory generated by X is contained in IFLR because IFLR, as we have discussed, is a tick subcategory. And the tick sub subcategory generated by X is the smallest subcategory contained, uh, is the smallest tick subcategory, subcategory that contains X. So, so we only need to show that IFLR is contained in tick X. So I wanna show that for every Y in IFLR, we have Y is in tick X. And I'm just going to use Hopkins and Neiman for that. So I'll take the mat, mat, take the matless dual. The matless dual of Y, this is going to be a perfect complex, which is supported to exa exactly at M. Same, same for X. So by Hopkins and Neiman, um, YV is contained in tick subcategory generated by XV, because these are both imperfect complexes. Now I'll take, um, take the matless dual again. So I get um, Y, Y double V is contained in the sub subcategory generated by X double V. And of course you take the, the matters dual twice for any complex, you get back um, the completion of the complex. But since we started with something that has finite length, 
i.e. it's um, supported at M, the, these complexes are already complete. So YW is, um, is, is quasi-isomorphic to, to Y itself. So this, this proves the proposition. As a corollary, we get um, the implication A implies B. So if there exists some X in IFLR with um, non-zero homology such that the injected dimension of this drive tensor product with R phi is finite, then for, for every Y in IFLR, we have um, the, the injected dimension of this drive tensor product is finite. Because since Y is in tick X, we have that take this exact this exact functor so we have r phi and tends to with y is in the tick subcategory sub -category generated by r phi tends with x but this is uh, by assumption this is um by assumption and uh, uh, and the proposition this is equals to i fell out yeah any questions so far all right so, um, so, so if we've shown that A implies B, B, B implies C, um, we, we have already discussed, um, is, uh, follows directly. So, so now I want to talk about um, how C, C implies D. So, so I'm assuming that um, for every Y in, F in, in, in IFLR and for every I greater than zero, we have this um, finite inject to this, this, the tensor product of R phi I drive tensor with Y has finite injected dimension. I want to show that this forces Y to have, to have had finite projected dimension to begin with. So um, for this, I need the notion of Lowy length. So, so, so let RMK be a local ring and X a complex of um, R modules. The Lowy length of X is defined to be the infimum of I such that the max M, M times I and to the power of I times X is equal to zero. And and the homotopical lower length is defined to be the femum of all the lower lengths of um, V where, v, where v is quasi isomorphic to X. Uh, and in some sense, this is the, the correct way to measure um, length in, in, a, in, in the drive category. So, so the, so the, the Lowy length um, satisfies some nice finiteness property, and this is due to Avmuth, Eyinger, and Miller. So uh, you have a local ring, let Ki be the Kazoo complex in a minimal generating set of M. Then for every complex, any complex X, we have the homotopical Lowy length of Ki tensor X is bounded by the Lowy length of the of the Kazoo complex, and that's finite. In fact, um, you 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 can give an upper bound. Um, I, don't, I don't remember on the top of my head what it is, but I think it has to do something with the A invariant of the link. So, proposition. Uh, so let, let's so so let phi be a local homomorphism from R to S such that phi of m is contained in n to the power of c, where c is um, the homotop homotopical Lowy length of the Gazoo complex on S. Then for every x with, with, with um, finitely generated bounded above homology, we have the tor I mean, bound below, bound below homology. Then we have the the tor of the tor R S X is bounded, or is zero for I bigger 
I, I large enough if and only if X has finite projected dimension. Uh, and so, so let me just um, make a mark what is going on here. That seems a little, well, it looked confusing a little bit to me in the beginning. So what is, what the C is doing is when you, you look at the R action on the kazoo complex on S, since M is contained in NC, and remember C is the, is the, is the low length on the, the low length of the, of the kazoo complex. So, so that, that forces the R action on the kazoo complex to factor through the residue field, the action of the residue field, right? Because you multiply by any element in, in, in M, multiply KS by that, that fact is to be something in NC, but, but that of course gives you um, zero. Okay, so, so the proposition is that if we have this um, local homomorphism where the maximum ideal of M gets pushed so far, uh, far into, um, into N, then, then tor, tor RSX is bounded above if and only if X is finite projected dimension. And so, so the if part is clear, obviously. Um, if, if you start something that has finite projected dimension, then it will have finite projected dimension in, in, in S2. But so, so we want to show the converse. So, so note that if the, so, so if, 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 if the homology of S tensor, tensor X is bounded, then the homology of, of KS tensor X is bounded because KS is, is nothing more than a complex of finite projective dimensions, it's a perfect complex. So, um, it, it, it will not make the this homology to be unbounded. And you can use subcategories, for example, to see that. But as um, but the complex KS is quasi isomorphic to the homology of KS in the, in DR because it, it factors through this um, action on K. And and an HKS has a K vector space structure as an R complex. So we can use the Knut formulas to show that um, the homology of K tens KS tensor X, this is quasi isomorphic to um, the homology of KS tensor over K with homology of K tensor, K to drive tensor with X. Now, we, we, we assumed that the, 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 this homology is bounded. Right, so so h of k uh, h of k derived tensor x is also ha also has to be bounded, but um, this 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 homology me measures the projective dimension of x over r. So this shows that projective dimension of r, or the projective dimension of x in r is finite. So uh, the remark is, is just want to point out, obviously, that if you if you have a contracting endomorphism from R from R to itself, then if you take if you take I large enough, then phi I M will will take M into M C, where C is the lower length of the Kazoo complex on R. So, so if I know that this, this, the complex R phi I drive tensor X has bounded homology for, for every I beginning at zero, then, then did, this can only be true if X already had finite projective dimension. So, so this gives me the implication that C implies D. And of course, if I have a complex finite projective dimension and finite injective dimension, then R is corner steam. 
Oh, I think I went a little too fast. Okay, so I, I just want to maybe point out um, two things here. To, to go from A implies B, uh, I, I, I only needed, I only used the fact that, I, that Y has finite injective dimension. And I use this analog of, um, I use this analog of um, Hopkins and Neiman. I, I didn't use anywhere that, um, that phi is contracting. The implication C implies D, I didn't use anywhere that Y has finite injective dimension. I, I only needed that Y has bounded homology. That's all I need. Uh, but but here I do need the fact that phi uh, is a contracting endomorphism. So, so so what I'm trying to point out here is so 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 what so so maybe let's let me go back to the main result. So, 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 so what this made us all the saying is if you have a, if you start with a complex of finite injective dimension and non-zero homology and finitely genital homology, if you, if you take the first base change, there's only two possibilities. Um, e either the complex will have um, finite injective dimension, in which case uh, every subsequent um, base change with phi will have finite injected dimension and R will be Gornstein, or, or, or this complex blows up uh, right away after the first step. In general, if you, if you take a, 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 um, a complex with maybe in the, with, with not finite injected dimension, but with just some bounded complex, it is possible that um, you can have the, the first few base changes still will, will still give you a bounded complex, but eventually the complex will become unbounded. Of course, if the complex never becomes unbounded, um, then, then the last um, proposition showed that, that com the, 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 the complex you started with uh, actually has um, finite projected dimension. So, so let me give you an example where this happens. Okay, so so let's look at this example I had in, in, the, in the beginning. So, so I start with um, with um, k x y and I uh, mod out x cubed y cubed and phi of x takes x phi takes x to y and y to y squared. Now I want to look at this complex. Um, this complex X, um, which, which is um, very easy to see. This com that X is um, is quasi isomorphic to to R mod X. Now, clearly, if if I, when I when I take um, R phi tensor with X. Um, this will give me so, so, so I'm, I'm just changing I'm just changing all these x's to y's so 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 this complex here r phi tends here with x this is quasi isomorphic to r mod y so so this is a bounded complex right this complex is definitely a complex that does not not have finite projective dimension however when when I go so, so my phase base change will still, the complex will still stay um, bounded, in bounded homology. But it, the second I take um, R phi squared, um, all these um, X squareds become zero and clearly this becomes a, a, a complex with um, unbounded homology. So, 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 the, so what I'm trying to show here is that um, I really need the, the finite injective dimension part to show that the complex will blow uh, for, for a complex of finite injective dimension, 
if it doesn't blow up in the first part, it's, it's never going to blow up. Uh, and in, any questions? All right, let's thank Rangers. Any questions? Excuse me? Yes, how? I want to ask questions that uh, does induction method apply for, for you for the proof in the in your theory? Sorry, um, sorry again. How is asking if you use induction in your proof? Uh, I use induction at one point, right? Um, oops. So so I'm I'm using induction to go from B imply C. So, 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 so here I'm showing that, so, so I'm assuming I, I know that for, for every Y in, in, in IFLR, we have the finite injected dimension of R phi is, is finite. So in other words, now I know that R phi drive tensor with Y is an IFLR. So now I can forget about about why coming from, from not why okay I can forget about R phi about this finite this complex of finite injected dimension finite general etymology coming from Y and I'm just looking at this right and now I'm taking okay. R phi on this again which is really taking R phi squared yeah 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 so so. So, so this is where I'm using conduction. Then you move to the lawyer case, yes. I just feel that this is something similar with the offlander batch bond theory. So I ask you this question, right? Say it again. I feel this is something similar to the batch bond offlander theory. So I ask you this question. Other questions for the speaker? I do have one. So sure. um, given the connection with Foxby's theorem, right, there are a variety of extensions of that. So for instance, if you've got a perfect complex of, or a module of finite projective dimension and finite G injective dimension, and that also implies that the ring's Gornstein. So do you have a, is there a G injective version of your, of your result? Uh, I actually have not think, thought about it. Um, there might be a, something interesting to think about. Hmm. I don't know. The answer is I don't know. And the answer is I've, I've, that, that I should probably think about it. <laughs> uh, a second question. If I could see the, the statement of the main theorem. That's not the question. Yeah, so I'm curious if you've thought about a dual version of this. So if you change the low times is to R hums and change the injective dimensions to, you know, projective dimension or flat dimension. And I don't know if there's a simple Matlas duality result or something like that that would give that for free, but. People think about base change along ring homomorphisms quite a bit, but co-base change is actually a little bit harder in mm. some respects. I believe there are some some results along those lines for 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 for, um, for co-base changes. I'm not. I don't know if um, there is actual this actual statement. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, exactly like this. Sure. I mean, one has to be very careful because you lose homologically finite. Yeah. Very quickly, for instance. Okay. I was just curious. I, I had a question similar to Sean's question. Uh, so I was wondering, uh, maybe not related to the theorem, but 
So if you have a proxy small object with finite injective dimension, okay. then, then can you, uh, is, is it true R Gorenstein? Mm. Prax, okay. Prax, remind me again what proxy small is? Um, it's, um, it can finitely build uh, a perfect complex in, in the drive category of finite, uh, finite homologically finite objects. Can she use like a the tensor with K as a witness? Was there a... Um, Oh. Yeah, just I was <laughs> this came to my mind as as I was looking at your your results so I was curious yeah, no. <laughs> so, so 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 I guess the answer is again that I don't know when I'm uh, maybe that's something um, we're thinking about The questions. Not a question, but I think for most, and there may, they there were some characterizations of Gernstein rings in the original paper of Dwyer Green and Greenleys and Yenga, which may I don't remember if it's what you're asking for. Oh yeah, okay. Thanks, Ben. All right, thank you. All right, well, let's thank our final speaker of the year. Thank you.